sense. The hero's journey, as they kept talking about in history, those that leave the town with the shield and the sword, slay a dragon and come back with stories. Depends yeah. on how it's received. And, and I'm curious, back in 2007, um, is the business today the same line of business, telemarketing, what you were doing back in 2007? I like the old school way. I like fireside chats. I like when people know first names and can get right to the point because they know what drink you have. And that's why they keep going back to cheers. And so for me, I, I can't stress enough old school soft skills. Let's slow down for a second. My brother, have you ever made phone calls before in a call center for 160 hours a month? All right, well, welcome, Team ET. It's indeed, once again, a pleasure to be here with you and with our guest, Mr. Richard Blank. Look, it's only a few weeks since the Western world, or at least most of the Western world, celebrated Christmas and New Year. And I'm wow. guessing, like many of us, you probably wrote out your resolutions for 2024. For me, I take it a little bit differently. I find this time of year is an opportunity to revisit my bucket list and to think which items I'm going to endeavor to tick off during the coming 12 months. And as it happens, one item on my bucket list is the destination of visiting Costa Rica. And you will have heard me in the introduction say that our guest Richard is based in Costa Rica. So I'm particularly excited today to chat and learn more about this wonderful country. Richard, I believe the traditional greeting in your part of the world is Pura Vida. I may have not pronounced it 100% correctly, but welcome to the ET Project, Richard. Great to have you here. Oh, I am so happy to be here as well. And you do get an A plus for your Spanish today. <laughs> yes, Pura Vida, pure life. Pure, pure it life. really does yeah. represent the feel and the culture here in this beautiful Central American paradise. Well, I wanted to kick off with that question. I mean, what is it like living in Costa Rica? First of all, I guess for many of our listeners, they won't know where Costa Rica is. So if you could give us a little bit of a geography lesson and, and what's it like living there? What's so incredible about this country? Well, look at the smile on my face. I've been here for 23 <laughs> years and married the girl of my dream. So that answers that question. But yeah. where is Costa Rica? Where is this rich coast they keep talking about? Well, it's north of Panama and it's south mm -hmm. of Nicaragua. We're the only democratic society in Central America. There's no standing army, Wayne, so they put all of their money back into education and boast a 95% literacy rate, the most neutral English accent, best infrastructure, and companies such as Amazon, HP, Intel, and Oracle are here. And our proxemics to the United States makes it a very powerful player in the BPO industry. But living here, my friend, you're talking about the best weather, the most beautiful people, um, really, um, just an hour away from the closest beach and you have hot springs and you have flowers and gardens and all this exotic fruit. And so for me, every day is like a dream. It's kind of right. funny growing up in Philadelphia, you'd come to vacation here. And then when you go back home, you're like, oh man, I'm here now. <laughs> so it's great. Every day to me feels like a Saturday Wayne. And so sometimes you have to get past your parents skill to make certain sacrifices. Right. in order to fill certain life's dreams and goals. So you mentioned you're from Philadelphia. So my connection with Philadelphia is through sport and <clears throat> Rocky Balboa. So when I was, I was younger, Rocky Balboa and the music from Rocky 1, 2, 3, all the way through to 5, I think, was, was my theme song that I played while I was grinding it out. Um, what's your experience coming from Philadelphia? I'd like to refer to Rocky Balboa for a minute. I thank you for bringing it up. We're talking about Chuck Wepner, who went 15 against Ali and didn't drop. The right. Bay Team Bleeder. And this guy was a real champ, and all the naysayers were against him. And so Sylvester Stallone watched that fight, created his Rocky. But as much as people say Rocky's not real, he's not from Philly, come on, man. You ask anyone from Philly about Rocky, we love Rocky. Rocky right. represents heart. There's a statue there. And Absolutely. so we run the stairs, we, we go through Kelly Drive, and we run all around the city to the Italian market. And so it's Philly pride, super Philly pride, getting up early when it's cold and you don't want to. That's Philly mm. pride. And so um, I got you. 
and I yeah. hear you. And where I grew up, fortunately for me in Northeast Philadelphia, I graduated the proud Abington High School back in 91. I had some real players that came out of this place. I got to right. play Stephen Schwartzman from Blackstone Group, Amber Bose, Ashton Carter, Secretary of Defense, Eddie George. He was with us till 10th grade. Sean Woodham went to the NFL. Michael Buffer. I mean, come on. These are some great people. Bob Saget and me. <laughs> so, I mean, some of, of us are in the Hall of Fame in this place. And we're proud of where we came from because we grew up with some amazing people that had vigor and courage, but also empathy. They're the ones that could knock you down on the playing field, but also pick you back up to to get you stronger. So I'm, I'm devoted and I love my friends. Yeah, and even I, though I, I left Philadelphia at 18, it was the perfect spark for me to right. continue on this vision quest of studying Spanish, moving abroad and, and starting life. And so it had to start somewhere, my friend. Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, I'm an observation guy, I have to say. And, and by that, I mean, I notice things. And uh, during my research, preparing for this conversation, there's there's a number of things that jumped off the page at me about Richard Blake. So the first is that you've done a lot of podcasts, um, but you speak very articulately. You've got a high degree of knowledge on various topics. And one thing above everything else is you dress impeccably. You're an immaculate dresser. You know, certainly the best dressed guest that I've ever had the pleasure to chat with. So I'm curious, what is it that drives you? What, what's your value, your belief system that gets you up every day? And you obviously have this, I don't know, inner pride, I guess. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate the due diligence. <clears throat> well, you know, the first thing is... The drive to do this, it, it really is paying it forward by coming here to another country and learning Spanish. And you're mentioning about being articulate. Well, I didn't have the grades or the discipline or maturity for medical school or for law school or engineering degrees. And so I knew that becoming a linguist might open doors and make me marketable. My favorite TV show of all time is Remington Steel. Do you remember Pierce Brosnan and Seth Lee Zimbalist back in the 80s? Come on, I had to dress like him. <laughs> you had to do it. That's my influence. And of course, just in case your mother shows up, Wayne, I got to make sure that I'm ready to go. And also respect yeah. for you and your amazing audience. But what's my drive? My, my drive is living life. Right. And right. the fact that I was able to do this and my stars became aligned. It's amazing for me. And, and these podcasts that you mentioned, which is interesting, I don't have a book nor seminar. And most people don't like telemarketers. So I'm trying to shatter misconceptions. All, all I'm trying to do is uncover one adventure of an entrepreneur. i started a company that grew to 150 seats and celebrates 16 years in a competitive industry, but it had twists and turns, but the beauty of it is, and, and I will say this, and I'm very fortunate, I have a luxury trade. I really do. Not because I'm an owner of a company. That's the price you pay. The fact that we study rhetoric and I deal with English second language employees. Mm -hmm. I get to focus on soft skills and have the infrastructure to study and really concentrate on these phone calls to crack some codes and to develop certain skill sets. And right. it's been fun. I haven't lost my fidelity towards it yet. It, it, I just get disappointed with the attrition and the sort of things that happen within this industry, but I still love what I invested my life, my time, and my chances in. Wonderful. Do you have a vision for yourself, for the future, for your wife and yourself for the future? Of course. I'm going to write children's books. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> it's going to deal with mini golf and Rube Goldberg experiments because I want things that are not electrical. I want to have some fun. So in case the internet goes down or the electricity goes off, you can still play like I did back in the 70s. And I still like creativity and using things around the house. Fantastic. That, that's a wonderful lead into your pinball fetish, but uh, we'll come back to that <laughs> at a later stage in the conversation. Um, it, you, you're sitting in Philadelphia, I guess. Did you study in Philadelphia or you, you studied somewhere else? It's an excellent question. I, I left Philadelphia once I graduated high school in 91. And right. so 
When I was growing up, we had the option of three languages, Spanish, German, and French. Now, all three are great languages, but I felt the one that was most realistic for me was Spanish. Right. And I gravitated towards it. And so I got an intermediate level when I graduated, a college recommendation letter from my dedicated Spanish teacher and from the principal of the high school to offset my poor grades because I was having too much fun. I really wasn't studying. But they got me into University of Arizona. And that was like great. It. Spent five so years there. I had to do a super senior year. <laughs> so um, but you want to know the cool thing? The fact that I did five years meant that I could take less credits a semester. And right. so what I did with that extra time was I interned for Telemundo for two years. So I got some work experience there and I sold ski trips and trips to Mazatlan so I could earn some money there too and get that experience. But at 27 out of one in a million opportunity, a really good friend of mine owned a call center here. And he said, Richie, come down for two months just to teach some English. Well, two months turned into working there for four years. I didn't learn it from the top, from the inside out. With the proletariat, I sat with them. And the one thing I learned more than anything, Wayne, is empathy. You extend that, you'll get it back in space. And so, yeah. Fantastic. I, I want to jump back a little bit, though, before we get into the shift to Costa Rica, uh, Richard, sure. if we can. You spent... I believe, a couple of semesters in Spain. So Spain is one of my favourite countries. I'm, I'm heading back over there in February, I'm, I'm happy to say. It, it's um, I, I just have this affiliation with Spain. Where in Spain were you, were you uh, studying? My good friend, that was the year that I shed my skin. I was 21. <laughs> I, was 21. I bought a Vespa scooter. <laughs> that... Right. Lived, I first started off in El Puerto de Santa Maria, which is right next mm -hmm. to Cadiz and Andalusia. So I spent right. three months there at, at the Estudio Internacional San Pere School. It was a really nice private school. And then mm -hmm. I spent one month in Madrid, right near El Corte Inglés. And right. so I was right there for one month. And then for two months during the Christmas break, I traveled. I went mm -hmm. as far east as Prague, as far south as the Pink Palace in Corfu. I spent a week in Amsterdam and I was also a week in Tangier. So I just went all around with that URL. I'd call home once a week, let them know I'm still yeah. alive. But I, <laughs> my man, I read more books. I had more conversations. And I also learned something about myself. When you're a child and your parents want to take you to a museum, you'd rather be off playing sports with your friends. But at this stage, when I'm in Paris or Prague, Brussels and Bruges and Milan. And when you're at the youth hostel and you've been out all night having the best time of your life for the 10th night in a row, most of these cats are sleeping in and they're waiting for the next party. I got up, I went to that museum. I saw those ruins, I went to that church. I'll catch right. you in three, four, five, ten 10 hours, but there's no way that I'm not going to these museums. Mm. And the most beautiful places in the world. And you, and you know that when you do something for yourself, it's 10 times better. Right. And I really slowed down and really appreciated this art compared to just glancing at it. I'm learning languages. I'm in Europe. I mean, it was almost like a renaissance for me. Yeah. And so all these things that I did in Philadelphia and in Tucson and everywhere else I was running around, really didn't matter where I was in these small towns. Mm -hmm. so the Costa del Sol and Tori Molinos just running around. <laughs> is, you really need to show your essence and, and just begin again because yeah. the bulls. I mean, that was cool too in Pamplona and San Sebastian and Ronda and Granada. I mean, what a place to travel and see. So I'm coming back after living in Europe for 10 and a half months and my Spanish is tight. I was working out even more. I was really healthy. I was falling in love. I learned to dance to Silviana, seeing these paintings and ruins. And I'm coming back. And even though Tucson's cool and the rec center at Arizona and all that fun stuff at the Wildcat House and dirt bags, I felt a little out of place. Right. I, everywhere is fun when you smile and have friends, but I was really drinking life. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be out of my element. I wanted things fresh. 
it was getting stagnant. And so I felt I was back there again. So I almost made myself that second promise that if I do get a chance at a mature age post-grad to have this opportunity to be an expat, boy, you better take it. Yeah, but yeah. people are going to say you can't do it and your parents and your family and your influence. Hero's journey. Sometimes yeah. you can do it. So and you're back, was, back in the US. You've come back from Spain. Sometime later, you get this opportunity to head south down to Costa Rica, um, mm -hmm. San Jose, I believe. Great opportunity to put your Spanish into practice, of course. Um, Spanish being the native language, I believe, right, in Costa Rica. Uh, so you're down there. What's what's going through your mind when you first arrive down there? Counting seconds, wishing that this would never end. Right. Once the honeymoon stage wore off, which usually does on a vacation, by the second week you realize where you're at. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't want to go home, and I only had two months. It's not a lot of time. Yeah. And so I was. I lost a lot of sleep, but I was on such endurance and energy that I didn't need it. I, I was really just bringing it on because it could end at any time. Right. And after those two months, because there are seven of us that came down originally, not just me. Mm -hmm. And just like the real world, we all lived together. It was five guys and two girls in this cool house. And as for another podcast at another day, <laughs> but one by one, they would go back to the States. They didn't make the eight weeks where they weren't producing well, where we were volunteering and working. They were just not taking it seriously. And I, I realized, man, if you don't do this now, it is never going to happen. Even though it's your boy, step yeah. up. I mean, really, I mean, you guys are having fun and there's a lot of yucks and everything, but let them see a different side of you. Let them see that you're the ace. You're the eyes and the ears. You got his back. It took me just a couple of weeks to be number one in regards to retention and customer support. Talk time, I was crushing all the metrics that they had in regards to conversions, in regards to the note taking and, and updating the third party information and even making suggestions to the CRM. I was learning, I was learning. And then after those eight weeks, I went to see my buddy and I said, listen, Joey, you mind if I stay? And he goes, I was going to offer that to you as well. And I almost started crying. You can't cry at 27, but I almost did. And I said, right. thank you. And I go, you're not going to regret this. And so I worked with my friend for four years and that was my graduate school. And if I didn't have that experience, there is absolutely no way that I would be yeah. in the position that I am today for the impulse control, maturity, and the experience. It was the perfect time and the perfect place. Those stars became aligned. So, you know, the, as they say in the movies, the rest is history. You, you go down, you fall in love with the country, with the people, you find the woman of your dreams, you marry that woman. I, I'm wondering, before you went to Costa Rica, did, did you ever have the ambition to start your own business, to be the entrepreneur, or were you just exploring life at this stage? What a wonderful question. Oh, there were such expectations for me. I should have been working at Honeywell or something or at my family's business. I was supposed to find the company that was offering the most benefits possible and right. the best salary you could get. And I think that's great, but it also caps you. I mean, if I'd prefer to be a, a hunter than a fisherman, because I feel that you have more flexibility compared to just being in one place and stagnant and hoping that you're in the right spot. You, you can zig and you can zag. The sky's the limit. And every day's fragile. So no, I was in a box. There were such expectations of me. In fact, I hate to say between me and you and your million person audience, they thought that my Spanish was a, was a parlor trick. It was cute. And the fact that my great grandparents came from Europe at the turn of the 20th and spoke Romanian, Russian, German, and Polish, that's one thing. They, they made their moves. They were the nomad. The fact that it skipped a couple generations and I'm the one that, that took the spark again and, and had this vision was it laughed at? No, but people fear what they don't understand. Mm. And, they, and, and they were supposed to compare me to their friends from the country club and the bridge and you know, when they play bridge with and, and their girlfriends and, and, and buddies. You kidding? How do you compare an host to somebody that doesn't have the same vision as you? How do you? 
-hmm. And so I think the best thing you can do is encourage somebody with good intentions. And I'm not the kind of guy to say, look at me now. Look at me what now? I just did my thing. And I'm right. proud of that. And I think most people, when they look in the mirror, can't look back because they realize they should have been something else. But there were so many things that were pressuring them to make these decisions. Some of them, they have to. They have children or other responsibilities. But when it comes to choosing a career, or investing your time, or even your self-pride and respect, you don't need to sell your soul for a dollar. Mm -hmm. And I, I just remember the old videos of David Bowie and, and, and Freddie Mercury under pressure. And it shows the people getting stuffed into the Japanese train cars or in New York City, the thousands upon thousands of professionals walking those, walking those sidewalks. It's exciting to look at, but I don't wanna be that. And I was almost willing to die with my boots on. And that's kind of scary if you really think about it. But you have to realize you got to live with yourself and, and, and time's a ticking. Now, I, I started my business when I was 35. This didn't happen early and I, and I wasn't prepared for it then. There are certain things that happen at certain stages of your life, which I believe naturally will give you the foundation to be successful. It's almost like a false start or you don't start at all. <laughs> you really have to time that wave so you can ride it. So you start your business around 2007, if, if I'm correct. W was there a trigger? You're down there for four years. I, I'm curious what, what happened that led you to kicking off your own company? Well, when I left my friend's center after four years, I did decide to work in my family's real estate business for about two and a half years. I okay. brought in a couple of seats, you know, started growing it. But then when the market fell out and I had a lot of pressure to come back home, mm. I decided to once again, double down on that. And so I had a little bit of savings, but I was also getting older and right. reality. Was hitting. And it wasn't funny or cute anymore. And I can't just, you know, pray and hope for it, but I didn't really have that sort of mentor to take me to the next level. And so I said to myself, well, why don't we just collect things and see if I can figure it out like MacGyver with duct tape. And so slowly but surely, the Richard trunk got branches and roots. Let me explain. I, I didn't have the capital to be where I am today. I have a three floor, 300 seat center. How do you start with no cash? Well, in my industry, you can rent a turnkey station at a blended center or for a couple hundred bucks a month, I can get that computer, some coffee, some lights and an IT guy at a place that could hold 400, but there's no privacy, but you can grow and it's reliable. And so that was great. I mean, it's just, you know, when I can do this and there's no outlay. And so I had to do that for about two and a half years until I had the stable clients. And also was realizing I was paying way too much money for this. It's time for me to, rent space and i did that for six and a half years where i built out the server room got used equipment because there is a turnover and you can get great equipment for a fraction of the cost same with used furniture and so i scaled as we grew like monopoly where you start with houses and you grow to hotels i i didn't overdo one area or another i i like things in layers so it's controlled and i was responsible with my money and i had the accountants and the attorneys and then just seven years ago, we moved into this building, built it out, and here we are. And so it's always cash, never an overextension, never bad partners. Because when you are in that sort of situation, you might be forced to make desperate decisions and you don't want to do things like that. And so grandma taught me, if you can't do it with cash, don't do it. So I just made sure that I lived in a very conservative way, made sure to pay the taxes and, and to do the right things. Um, is it glamorous? No, <laughs> but guess what? My plane got off the ground and it never touched zero again. And so how exciting, look what happened when you create something from nothing, it's like magic. That's, that's and so I was just going to do that. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about the business because um, it, it's a call center business, but maybe not the traditional sense of what people think about a call center. And, and I'm curious, back in 2007, um, is the business today 
the same line of business telemarketing what you were doing back in 2007? That's why it's such a great podcast. What an intelligent question. Um, when I first started, I launched the website in October 2007, landed my first account February 6th of 2008. It is a lot different. The CRM mm -hmm. systems, the predictive dialers, you know, even the sort of accounts that came in, COVID destroyed the call center culture. Yes. It allowed us to survive because we could have people working virtually. And I was very fortunate. And I'm, once again, I'm humbled by that. But then again, our culture was about the synergy, mm. and feeding off the energy and, and being there. But I do understand travel distance, money and convenience, but what are you gonna do? Mm. But today, a lot of companies are preferring omni-channel non-voice support. IVRs, integrated voice response, pressing buttons, voice activated, and, and that's fine. But let me ask you a question, my man, how many times you press in zero? <laughs> Yeah. I want to speak to somebody. I'm sick of repeating this and I'm sick of all your options that have nothing to do with me. I want old school A plus concierge service where you're holding my hand and letting the feather fall. And so I, I've seen that when we do get certain accounts that blend those sort of options, mm. when they do get our people on the phone, their guns are blazing. They're frustrated. They need to you know, decompress a little bit. So I, I, as much as they might be saving money by having self-checkout, they're also saying that they're losing a lot of money because people are ripping them off <laughs> and it's not working out and, and the time's not working. And so I, I, I think that if you want to retain a client, you got to give them the best service possible. Yeah. And if it's just one by one, you might not be making a lot. Well, how about if they recommend you to five people? Now you're making your money. And so slow down and calm down. I like the old school way. I like fireside chats. I like when people know first names and can get right to the point because they know what drink you have. And that's why they keep going back to cheers. And so for me, I, I can't stress enough old school soft skills. And I don't want ethics compromised. I don't want you to rush our agents when we're building rapport. Mm -hmm. And you must allow us to do our craft. Because if you do, you're not going to get the sort of fulfillment that you're looking for. And morale will be low and Billy's going to quit. And so yeah. it's a very delicate balance that we have here. And um, But what an interesting industry. The Hollywood really glamorizes it with the Wolf of Wall Street and Boiler Room and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. And I mean, you can name a thousand movies. And yeah. I love glib speech, artists of speech. But just like fire, it could be used for warmth, life, and health, but it also can be used to burn you. And some of these exceptionally talented individuals really should be focusing their energy and attention to things that have better faith, you know, and better intentions. Cool. Uh, it's great, but then again, you can make money a lot of different ways. You, you don't have to do it by angling. Yeah, for sure. So we're, we're now 16, 15, 16 years into, into the business. I, I'm imagining, I can sense the passion. I'm sure everyone listening can sense the passion that you have. What, what are some of the memorable moments that really stand out that shaped the company and perhaps even shaped you as a senior executive leader it, during this period? I can name you three. How does that sound? We'll go, we'll go introduction, body, and conclusion. <laughs> February 6, 2008, when I closed my first account, it was for one seat for one week. Best mm -hmm. day of my life. Okay. I got a kiss at the dance. Yeah. And so, all right, what's the second thing that happened? Well, back in 2010, I lost my largest client. So I went from 89 seats down to four. And I learned a couple very strong lessons then. But the one lesson that I really learned was that I'm not a one trick pony and lightning does strike twice. And if you really have faith in yourself, you take a hit and you keep moving forward. So I'm very happy that I continue doing that. Am I happy that I lost the account? Of course not. The character is judged during chaos. So when I look back on how I handled myself, I'm not disappointed or embarrassed. Now what's the third thing? Being on your podcast today, my man, look where I'm at. Oh, yeah. So these are three milestones of the company, the spark, the dip, and then the apex. And so mm -hmm. your clients need to know 
that there are cycles in business and some people might have the best run ever and they're the greatest, but most people have their spikes and dips. And as I say before, just don't break windows and scream at people. Really just handle yourself in a balanced way so you can make your best decisions. And as you mentioned earlier, the industry is um, notorious for high attrition rates. Yes. That, I believe, is not so much the experience for you. I, I'm wondering, what is it that you do different to the general populace within the, the call center BPO industry? Okay. Well, let, let's look at it in a very candid way. There's two types of attrition when you have natural and forced attrition. Let's do forced attrition. Yeah, you know, Billy's showing up late, smoking weed at lunch, not making his phone call, a cancer, a jumper, and a disruptor. He's got to go. I mean, it's just, I know he's got great English, but he's, he's the worst. Yeah. So what are you going to do on that? But secondly, you have natural attrition. What happens if somebody is studying at the university to be a doctor? It might be a scheduling conflict. Yeah. How about transportation? It could be closer to their home. Maybe their girlfriend works there. And if you're highly marketable, maybe there are more lucrative opportunities. Do I take it personally? No. But yeah, if you just leave here without a two weeks notice and can't even look in my eyes and say, Richard, we had a great run. Mm. That's nice. I I'd like to still bump into you one day and be proud to know you. I mean, you right. started strong. You can end strong. So at least through my accountability to my client, it allows me the time. That's why that's two weeks to do that transition. But I tell you what, if I do get the piece out, not show up on Monday because Amazon's hiring and it's a better schedule, those are the times that I will call my client with no surprises. I always have a solution. Let them know what's going on. And as much as you think it might set you back one, it's only because of Billy. What it's really doing is pushing you forward nine because your client trusts you, knows you're a straight shooter and you got the plan. And so if they think that these people are going to tattoo the name of the project on their forehead and work here for the next two decades, they're sadly mistaken. There are things that happen outside the office that affect this industry. Plus they have leverage. There are so many centers here that compete. It could be hired tomorrow. And so what do I do to keep them? Well, I guess the basics. I, I, I can't sometimes compete with the bells and the whistles of Amazon, but when I know your name, prior to making a phone call, we'll do a two-hour soft skills class. What about playing pinball and Pac-Man in my game room so we can bond and you can meet other people, break bread together, give you dignity and respect? Yeah, but Richard, how do you compete? I'm only 150. These guys are 10,000. So I can be exceptionally selective through natural filtering. So the people that want to be here, that want to stand out, that want me to give them additional responsibilities, be a page to a night. That is the sort of company culture environment that these people feel like they finally found. The coach, the teacher, the best friend or the mentor that they never had. Because I'm a straight shooter. I'll call the balls and the strikes and give you some Philly guilt. And I will mm -hmm. praise you and get you to the next level. And so... It's interesting, you, you see people with chivalry still, and I like that. And so I've been able to survive in this exceptionally competitive industry, mean because of the way I've treated these people. Mm. Because if not, there's a guy that's gonna pay him another 30 cents or be close to his home or who knows, but, but I get him and I get him the old fashioned way. Right, so it sounds like you're a very empathetic, um, almost compassionate uh, boss. So you really create that environment where the the staff enjoy coming to work rather than just seeing it as another another paycheck. Let's slow down for a second. My brother, have you ever made phone calls before in a call center for 160 hours a month? I have not. I haven't had that. Well, time. good. Have you ever been on a predictive dialer that makes you make four to 600 phone calls a day where you're in <laughs> constant ready status where it's like a batting cage? So... Do I have empathy towards them? Of course I do. I'm one of them. But instead of burning out, I thrive. And instead of just being once a monk, I rose to the occasion and said I could do something differently here. So are they carrying weight if they want to? 
let me explain something. If somebody enjoys making calls, enjoys speaking with people, understands positive escalations, company name spikes, turn taking, transitional sentences, rhetoric, the thesaurus, you choose much more diplomatic and strategic vocabulary. It's a beautiful dance. Time flies, Whoa. you make ton of money. Just like, just like in the Wolf of Wall Street, when Leo was making that phone call in front of everybody, it was I think one minute and 46 seconds. And everyone looks at him and goes, hey, how did you do that? Really listen to what he's saying. He's not speaking Greek. He's not, he's not doing anything that we all can't do. The man was living in the now. He was using his hands as illustrators. I mean, watch it without sound. This guy is exceptionally animated. His yeah. back was to everybody else because everyone else is the peanut gallery. They're wasting time eating pizza, you know, smoking cigs. I don't know what they're doing. This guy was facing the wall like the pros do. You want that corner to put your rhetoric on the wall and just get in there and bang it out. And so the real pros look at that and they realize that he wasn't better than anybody else. He's just trained. He has discipline. He had structure. Mm -hmm. He had certain mentors. And so that, when I watch those videos with individuals, I pause and I start yelling at the people in the back that are standing and watching. Why? They should be making phone calls. We'll go over your calls during QA class. You shouldn't be off the call. You want to watch them live? I got the call recorded. We can listen to it a thousand times. Mm. Why are you ruining your pace? See, that's the sort of difference here. It's leapfrog. It's, it's baton passing. It's the kind of people that you only get better when you work with people that are with you or better. That's why I like to play golf with people with a better handicap. I play better golf that day. Yeah. And so you surround yourself with greatness that, that don't stop that momentum. He looked surprised when everyone was looking at him. He's like, why isn't everyone working? And I agree with him. I agree with him 100%. And I well, agree with Blake from Glen Gary, Glenn Ross. He still called the people gentlemen, even though he told uh, Shelly Levine he can't have coffee. It's not the point. So the leads are out there. The money's out there. You got it yours. If not, I have no sympathy for you. God well, made $970,000 in one year, but he made it. He didn't force people to sign. And right. so... He, you might not like him, but you have to respect the art of someone that can convert sales and mm. do things at a certain level. And so maybe through a certain medium, a conversation or just a certain approach or due diligence prior to knowing somebody, you might shatter that misconception. And, and so I'm an owner of a company and a lot mm. of people don't know me. So they may judge me on what happened to them at their last job. And I don't think that's very fair as I'm not judging this individual of what seat they're replacing or adding to. I think everybody deserves a clean slate. And if you can start, then everybody leaves something on the table way. Mm. Look, Richard, we're getting close to the end. So I, I can't wrap up without touching on one of the things you've mentioned. And, and I know we've spoken about several times you're, you're a pinball wizard, or at least that's the, the expression or the vision that I have in my mind when, I, oh. when I'm with you. So you have this um, passion about acquiring pinball machines, jukebox machines, and um, you bring it into your business. It's part of the, the culture, part of the psyche that you expose to the staff. You give them the opportunity to participate. Where, where did the idea come from? You, you have the largest collection in Costa Rica, I believe, of pinball machines. Where, where did this start from? Growing up in the 70s and 80s, I love the retro arcades. Pinball was too difficult and expensive. And so mm -hmm. that was a luxury for me. But one man's trash is another man's treasure. And when I started making money and had discretionary income, I don't know why, but instead of going out to get a Rolex, I'll get three pinball machines. <laughs> Or both. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, the main thing is that you you get your passion. And mm -hmm. some of these people are just giving them away. I got 15 pinball machines, six jukeboxes, plus an assortment of games and an air hockey table. But you need a recess area. You need a medium for people to let off steam, recharge batteries. But I also have the space for it. And I also have a bunch at home as well, in my own game room. But I tell you what, my friend, you can grab a machine down here for, let's say, four or five hundred bucks like a 1994 Arnold Schwarzenegger, Last Action Hero, Data East. 
And for another 500 bucks, you can get some of the parts in the United States after an electrician goes through it. A couple extra hundred dollars of some shininess and tender loving care. And so for about a grand, you're sitting on a machine worth about six grand. And they're incredible. And so people play virtual pinball, but there's a huge difference between things that are virtual and in real life. And so the restoration, my friend, my oldest machine's in 1970, Bally's Camelot. And then I have everything in between. And you know, it's the coolest thing, Wayne, when you see these older machines, they don't have the stickers of the laminates. It's really painted wood. So just like some of the old musical instruments, you, you see cracks in these woods. So it gives it its own individual role. But I'm weird. I'll speak to them, you know, caress them and talk to them, tell them how beautiful they are. And people are just like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> are you kidding me? They're the most beautiful things in the world to me. And, and one of the greatest gifts is to know what you like and not be forced to like something you don't enjoy. And I can understand when someone buys a painting. And they just stare at it. And so when I see these beautiful works of art that have been preserved, all it can do is just bring me alegria. I just get super happy when I see them. And, and they're the old bells, you know, the xylophone and the old wheel. And a lot of these agents who grew up on their phone are putting them away and hanging out by the machine, old school style. And right. I think that's cool. It, what what's the most impressive thing you've seen from your staff around the pinballs? Like, do, do you see groups gathering, cheering people on as they're playing? Like, how, how does it impact the morale, the motivation, the, the whole culture within the business? Well, you hear certain noises from people. They squeal and scream. <laughs> hey, they get out of character. Or they are a character because upstairs are serious or they're doing their thing. But when and they're hitting certain shots or the ball goes right down the alley, they, oh, man, and then everyone starts laughing. And it really breaks down barriers. It reduces mm -hmm. ego defense. I've seen, I've seen people fall in love by the Pac-Man machine and then get married. I mean, what do you want me to say? I love the time when people play because mm -hmm. play is where you make your best friends. And if you have a best friend, you want to hang with your friend. And if your friend's at work and he's your best friend, look what I created. It's, it's just Absolutely. not all about me all the time. I just can't do all this. I need individuals to grow, yeah. really. And so I, I have these, not like spokes people, but the ones that really get it. Been with right. me 10 years. The ones that, you know, the newbie that doesn't understand personalities or, or things, they can eat, it's like a big brother, it's an onboarding. It's, it's the sort of thing where I, I've known strategically to place newbies with certain people, not only to learn the job, but to learn the groove. Mm. And, and that's very nice because little by little, I hear the giggles and the laughing and, they, and then I start teasing them saying, it's about time, come on Wayne, got nice teeth, you're finally smiling. <laughs> I start giving them really guilt. And then we right. start doing nicknames and everyone's doing great. And then you look on the wall and they're number one. And so the next thing you know, a new person comes in. I let them know, hey, sophomore, you're not a freshman anymore. <laughs> and those are the first checkpoints and stages to see if they can handle that. If they do, they keep moving up with Richard. And so everybody gets to do a little bit above and beyond naturally just to see what, what right bus, right seat, Wayne just to see where they fit best in this organization. Richard, as expected, it's a great conversation. Final words of wisdom. So our listener base traditionally or primarily leaders, final words of wisdom for, for our listeners. Of course. First is I, I, I can't thank you enough, Wayne. I had the best time and you are my main man, but my, my best bit of advice for you and your amazing audience is just to never be hard on yourself, okay? At the end of the day, when you put your head on the pillow and have your moments of clarity, realize this, regardless of the outcome, hopefully you did things with the most honorable intentions. And if you can do that, you can live with yourself. And I learned that lesson a long, long time ago. There are expectations, but you have your own expectations and the level above that are 
realistic expectations. And um, that's why I like to gather. The more little piles you can gather, it's easier to carry. And then eventually it becomes big, big pile. And that's kind of what happened with me. Wonderful uh, way to finish off. It, are you interested in people connecting with you? Would you like people to follow you on LinkedIn or like, what would you like as a um, moving forward? Do you want people to know more about the business? No, if they like anyone that pays attention is great, but uh, if they want to come visit Costa Rica, definitely reach out. I have a very large Facebook fan page, Costa Rica's call center. It's got 126,000 local Costa Rican Ticos. And so when this goes live, you're going to have a bunch of new fans. And as I say, I'm, I'm just here, my friend, to pay it forward. I have no book or seminar. I'm not selling anything and people most likely don't like telemarketers, but just to let you know, there are people like us out here trying to retain clients, do some upsells, get some referrals, and really try to put some class into this industry. Yeah, and I, I have to say, I, I believe you're succeeding in doing all of those things. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful story and, and great to connect with you. Richard Blank, thank you for being on the ET Project. It's been an absolute pleasure. So what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button below and click on the bell icon so I can pop up in your feed occasionally with a great tip for your ultimate growth.